So, hi everyone. I'm Simon Axton. I work on our privacy and public policy team. Uh, and as John said, I'll be representing Chris Kelly, our chief privacy officer. Um, and so, because he couldn't make it this week, uh, he you know still wanted to present to you all. So, um, we put together a video last week um, that I'll play alongside alongside some slides. Actually, I'll probably just play the first couple minutes of the video um, because we can't sort of do them concurrently here and then switch to the slides with the audio playing um, and then switch back to the video for sort of some closing remarks. Um, so let me go ahead and do that. Hi, I'm Chris Kelly, the Chief Privacy Officer of Facebook. For those of you who don't know me, if you're watching this video and if I'm not with you in person, it's because uh, you know uh, I'm, I'm believing that parental responsibility begins at home uh, my wife and I are just about at uh, her due date for our first child, and so I am either uh, about to become a father or uh, have become a father by the time that you're watching this. And uh, you know, again, parental responsibility begins at home, so I am uh, at home with her and the baby. I, I hope by this point. Um, uh, again, I'm very sorry I couldn't be there with you today, but uh, you know, we've been engaged in this process for quite some time. We'll continue to be engaged in this process. And Simon Axton from our team uh, will be there in the room with you to answer any questions that may come up. What I want to talk to you about today, what we do at Facebook around community verification of both identity and age, the activity that uh, is actually core to uh, a, a large part of our mission. Because we have a principle of authenticity in the way that people interact, understanding who they are and what age buckets they fit into is a critical part of this. So we're going to run through four main agenda items today. First of all, the principles of Facebook and the four levels of community verification that interact. Secondly, community verification operation. Third, uh, some polling of our team Facebook users uh, to see how they understand the site and what they see in their experience. And then finally, questions uh, that you may have, and Simon from our staff is here to answer those. So, first of all, some Facebook facts. Would have liked to We're a technology company, which means that we try to build scalable solutions using technology and using technology to reflect social interaction as we see it in the real world. Uh, we refer to ourselves as a social utility to communicate and share information. Ultimately, we're trying to make the world a more open and connected place, but a core part of that is control and privacy over personal information. We now have more than 100 million active users worldwide, and each day on the site, there are more than 50 million people communicating and sharing information on Facebook. Our privacy principles operate in this sphere. In meeting this uh, goal of making the world more open and connected, we're trying to do it because, with privacy because users do uh, appreciate and make choices based on the sharing of personal data. The constant refrain that you see in the mainstream press about when you put something on the internet, it's available to everyone. At Facebook, we think that the world could be slightly different and people can have control over the information that they want to share with others. We set up rules uh, around access to profiles and access to the information within them that uh, are actually quite sophisticated and industry leading. First of all, when you create a profile, you, unless you join a network or begin to confirm friends, your profile is not available to other people and their profile is not available to you. This confirmed verification is a critical part of the way that Facebook operates. Um, Overall, these network and friend restrictions are designed to replicate real-world uh, social connections and sharing the way that people actually share information in the real world and with whom they share information. We know that people like to share information. They don't necessarily like to share it with everyone. We try to replicate those set of controls. And by means of quantifying this, we like to use a, st a statistic to show that less than 0.1% of Facebook profiles are actually available to the average user. And if you apply for you statistical people out there, if you apply the median user, the number is even smaller. It's actually quite important to stress that we are not one unified social network that lets everybody see everybody else's profile, but more than 100 million social networks. And you'll hear me say that a few times. Another important principle for us is that there be accountability for the posts that you make online. So when you post on someone's wall, your name and your profile picture will go along with that post. When you upload a photograph, it's tied to your account. 
This type of accountability deters online misuse, and it works quite well, as you'll see, as we move throughout the process. So in looking at community verification, we see four levels of that. The first is authentication, mainly at uh, the, the time of the inception of an account, but also on an ongoing basis over time. Secondly, the principle of segmented communities, which actually helps that authentication over time. Third, we offer innovative privacy controls and technical protection. And then finally, we have a user operations and investigations team, which can go through all of the, the reports and the automated uh, services that bubble up, potentially harmful information on Facebook, and get it addressed in a timely fashion. First, I want to talk about authentication. Um, it cannot be stressed enough how important it is that Facebook has a real name culture instead of a screen name culture. As you see a lot of the interactions in the real world which are problematic, um, teenagers getting on chat rooms, etc., a lot of the problems there are driven by anonymity uh, and not so much the internet writ large. At Facebook, we've always had a real name culture where your activity is tied to your account. This drives better behavior online and a safer and more trusted environment. At, at sign up, at, at sign up rather, we enforce this real name culture with technical checks. Um, if you try to sign up with fake names, common fake names, we're constantly building a gray list of names that aren't generally allowed. Some are absolutely blocked, the Mickey Mouses and the Donald Ducks of the world. Others may be more, you know, sort of, you require you to write in. Your real name might be John McCain, uh, but uh, you have to write in to get permission to create a John McCain profile in that instance. Um, we further use tokens and technological verification for access to networks. If you want to join the Stanford University network, you have to have a stanford.edu email address. If you try to add it without that, you won't get on that network. Um, and then finally, we have ongoing technical and community verification where people are seeing your profile as you start to interact with friends and other network members. We have measures deployed to see if, if how people are reacting, if they're ignoring your friend requests, if you are uh, sort of confirmed as you know being the person that you say you are, as I'll show in, in greater particularity later on, and also are you interacting with people of your own age. So there are means to take the massive amounts of data that are being generated on our site every day because of the 50 million users who are there and interacting to uh, determine whether or not uh, the person is the, who they say they are and are they the age that they say they are. So the principle of segmented communities is the second thing we want to cover. It cannot be stressed enough that Facebook is not one social site where if you sign up, you get access to everyone's profile, or they're all available in every search engine that you can imagine. Um, we're a hundred million different social networks. Each individual person has their own set of friends, the own, their own set of, of community interactions, whether it be the, the networks that they're a member of or the particular friends that they have. These connections are based on real world social factors. Um, you have both the real name culture, but then you have the people that you're interacting with on a daily basis. Again, people returning to the site in massive numbers and having that kind of real world check. Um, we apply special rules for over 18s and under 18s when they join regional networks, which are probably our broadest network. So if a user in the Chicago network, if an under 18 user joins the Chicago network, their profile is actually not available to over 18 users in the Chicago network. It's only under other, other under 18 users. And then, of course, they have their regular friends networks as they've joined the high school network. Um, they have those interactions all to verify. We like to say that this provides a built-in neighborhood watch program for every user on the site. Again, not perfect. No site, no system can ever be perfect. No city in America is without a jail. No city in the world is without a jail. But you, and so you have to have rules and you have to enforce them. But if you set rules and enforce them and you build the right culture, you actually get great pro-social interaction. Now, another part of this is our innovative privacy controls and technical protections that we offer on the site. Users control how their information is available after we apply our protective defaults. There are multiple options for users to make about you know, the reason, their own reasonable personal choices 
I want these friends to see this video and not these friends. I, you know, I, I don't want everyone to have access to this particular piece of information, even all of my friends, in the profile. Um, I want a, a, uh, my friends in this network to have access to my cell phone number, but not a regional network, which is actually the default. We restrict access to contact information in regional networks. Beyond these protection defaults, beyond the privacy settings that we have that are accessible easily from every page in the site, we have systems, um, one of which we call Karma. We have a number of different systems, but Karma is a good example, where if you're a user who uh, is sending only friend requests, if you're a 35-year-old user who's sending only uh, uh, friend requests to 14-year-olds, um, that fact will be bubbled up by the Karma system. Your account will be uh, warned and then disabled, and in fact, you know, if, if it's the right type of case, if there's any other uh, indication of untoward activity, that can be turned over to law enforcement. We have robust reporting infrastructure, some of which we'll show uh, later on in this presentation. And then we have other systems working uh, all the time to detect anomalous behavior on the site. And we're really encouraged that more and more sites on the internet are duplicating the controls that we've pioneered. We think that this is a key part of the future of the internet, is allowing people to control who has access to their personal information. So let's take a look at the reporting infrastructure in particular. Now you'll see a slide that has a uh, picture of Fenway Park on it, which my colleague Simon has uploaded. There's a reporting link that's circled on that, uh, on that photograph. And there's a message that he's tried to send to another user where the user can report. And there's a link, uh, there's a, 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 an illustration of the pop-up that occurs where you can say, what is the problem with this particular report? These, Reports are reviewed very quickly, so 100% of nudity, pornography, and harassing message reports are reviewed within 24 hours. And where there's a more sophisticated report, something that might come in from a parent that, with a fuller email, we immediately respond to it, um, absolutely within 24 hours has been our service level commitment, and we have it resolved within 72. These service levels have helped drive great behavior on the site. So even when the systems that we've applied don't work at preventing all bad behavior. No system works at preventing all bad behavior. We can address it quickly and with committed time levels around that. So thousands of accounts are disabled per week uh, for either a violation of the, the, the technical means that limit, um, the, that, uh, that limit uh, friend requests, too many friend requests, too, many, too much posting on particular walls, um, approaches to non-friends, those, are, you know, those can all lead to account disables. And then when we further review accounts that are bubbled up um, through, through these systems and through reporting links, more accounts can be disabled. Finally, we've got the cops on the beat. We have our user operation and investigations team. They're a further line of defense between our privacy protections and our, our technical protections as they operate. So user, uh, user uh, um, you know, operated privacy settings and the technical protections that are operating behind the scenes. This team handles hundreds of thousands of user requests per week, user contacts per week, um, and addresses them with the service levels that we've talked about around the most serious events and, and also very good service levels around things like I forgot my password, uh, et cetera. Now, this team works extensively in the site, and they have cleanup tools that can uh, clean up spam attacks and, and other activities as people you know, try to mis misuse and abuse the site. One of the things that needs to be stressed, especially, especially with a site operating at the scale that we do, is that we're under constant assault from people who have tried to misuse it. Not so many, because of these other protections that we've deployed, we've seen a lot fewer of the classic um, you know, attempts to, to get to kids, etc. But we see a lot of spam and a lot of, of other hacking attempts on the site. And we've got tools to clean that up on those rare occasions where it sort of gets through for a time. Um, and then if there is serious abuse, and particularly if there's anybody who's trying to do harm to kids, our investigation team gathers evidence and works very carefully with law enforcement to address problems as they occur. Um, you know, in those very rare cases that we've had to deal with serious safety incidents, we're on the phone with law enforcement quickly and responsibly and working very proactively with them. Now, I wanted to give you an example of community verification in action. 
Um, first of all, you'll see a peer verification slide for a user 13 to 17. Now, we don't like to get too much into the particular tuning of all of these systems because we're worried that people may try to game it as they know more information. But we're very happy to share um, the, the broad contours of how these systems work and, and, and what they do in everyday operations. So when a new user, 13 to 17, we used to force them all into high school networks. Um, a number of kids who were being homeschooled complained, and we realized that there were ways to do community verification for homeschool networks. Now, the school protection is, is a useful one, and, and one that, that sort of helps in those segmented communities and is still important to us, um, as we'll show in a minute. But you know, we wanted to let more homeschool kids on the site. So we have a new system where friend requests that they send out are accompanied with a verification question asking whoever they, they set a friend, they, they try to uh, send friend requests to, or ask, do you know this user personally? So if somebody tried to get on and say that they're a 14-year-old, and they start sending out friend requests, every person that they send a friend request to is going to get the, do you know this person personally? Now, if, uh, you know, the, when the recipient is, is verified in that age, then they can check it. If users answer that, that they do know that person, you know, a certain number of times, then the account is considered peer verified and is allowed to, to have more activity on the site. If users answer no, the account is disabled, and then it requires a special review to become re-enabled in any way. Our customer service people would have to look at an account before it would be reenacted and re-enabled, and, and in most cases it's not, and people who are trying to do anyone harm or trying to create a fake account abandon the account. And then if there isn't verification over a certain period of time, then the account is disabled automatically. I'm looking at the also another example of this community and peer verification at the start. Um, if new users sign up and try to join a high school network, the people in that network as they send out friend requests are asked, does this person attend this school? Um, does this person currently attend this school? We also have age restrictions. If somebody who is you know, who is, is, you know, sort of not of age tries to sign up for a high school network, that's also blocked. Um, so, again, there has to be this community and peer verification of someone to join the high school network. Now, for high schools that issue their own email address, we use that authentication token instead, providing an even greater level of security. So if, if users answer to confirm that this person attends this high school, um, then, you know, over a few uh, confirmations, then they are indeed admitted to that network. If you know people say that, that, that this person did not attend this school, then the account is disabled and, and flagged for further investigation. And if, again, if the time passes and sufficient answers haven't been granted, then indeed the account is disabled. So to go forward again, this is just one example of the verification means that we use. Um, we also have the reporting infrastructure that sits out there over time. Um, if someone were to sneak through and get into a particular network, there's always the report this user, they don't belong in this network option. Um, we have our automated systems, um, Karma and other rate limits that say, if you're trying to friend too many people, if too many people are ignoring your friend requests, then your account can be disabled and flagged for further review. And then if you don't have a confirmed school email or phone number, but you've gone through some of these other um, measures, if you, um, you know, there will be periodic tests where we put up a CAPTCHA, um, a, you know, the squiggly lines that you see to prevent bots and also to, you know, quite frankly, annoy humans who might be trying to game systems. And, you know, until we, we want more verification factors uh, for accounts over time. We thought it would be useful to wrap up with looking at some polling data for teen users. Facebook has said a polling feature where you can put a, a you know, request for a response in users' newsfeed uh, in you know, regular times in the site. And you select a demographic, we selected 13 to 17, and it'll show to a random set of users on, uh, on the Facebook site. So it's statistically significant for Facebook users, if not for all teens. Now, the first question we asked was, have you ever seen nudity on Facebook, or have you ever seen nudity on any other a website other than Facebook. And as you can see from the results, the vast majority of users had actually not seen nudity on Facebook. Um, you know, and then on other websites, the majority of users had seen nudity, you know, sort of certainly uh, relatively regularly. And, and that's an indication of the responsibility culture that we've driven and of, you know, and of our, our means of addressing 
inappropriate material quickly. Um, we secondly asked, do you know the people you interact with on Facebook in real life? And this is probably the most astounding statistic and, and is a testament to the work that we've tried to do and, and largely succeeded in, um, although it's important to stress we're constantly tuning these uh, techniques and trying to improve them. Um, half of users said that they know of most of uh, the, the people that they interact with on Facebook. Uh, almost another half said that they know all of the people that they interact on Facebook. Only 2% indicated that they didn't know most or any of the people that they knew on Facebook. Um, we like to think that that's a pretty incredible statistic and uh, it's the type of, of activity that we're going for. We want to know the people that you interact with in the real world. We asked these 13 to 17 year old users also, have you ever used Facebook's privacy settings to limit access to your information? Now it's important to stress first of all, because of our default settings, we like to say 100% of our users use privacy settings on Facebook. But these are the users who've gone further, who've taken other action to, to tweak the settings and, and sort of um, keep their information more private. Now, almost two thirds reported that they've used the privacy settings. So more than 70% of girls and more than 50% of boys. We like to think that that's a good indication that a lot of the messaging, both that we've been driving and that, that has been driven by other actors in schools, is teaching kids more and more about internet safety and how to keep themselves safe uh, as well. Now, with all of that, uh, I'm sorry that I can't be there in person to answer your questions. As uh, many of you know, I'll be available uh, whenever I can be uh, as these things come up. But Simon is there. He's been with our, uh, our company uh, for three years now, uh, started in user operations, knows this, uh, these systems very, very well, and will be an able, uh, able substitute for me in answering these questions. So uh, again, I'm sorry I couldn't be uh, there with you today, but parental responsibility does begin at home. Uh, so I'm home and uh, will be with you again soon. Uh, again, thank you very much, and I'll see you in the near future. We have two mics here. If people want to rush up to them, ask questions of Simon. And just a reminder, this is being recorded and uh, webcast as well. Teresa Polaris, you might start by telling us again who you are. But yes, I'm <laughs> Teresa Polaris from Polytechnic University of NYU. One? How would that be? I have found uh, that I have been able to interact with my nieces and nephews via Facebook. They never answered my e emails. They certainly don't want to talk to me on the phone. But I am a college professor, and they all uh, are on Facebook. And I uh, realized while you were uh, playing your video that I almost uh, extensively, uh, almost exclusively use Facebook to interact with my uh, young nieces and nephews. Uh, none of them are over 21, and some of them are like 10 years of age. Do you think I have been flagged in your system? <laughs> uh, that's, that's a good question. Um, I would say probably not, and it's, it's because we actually... Uh, monitor these interactions much more closely if they occur between non-friends than if they occur between friends, so people who've actually confirmed a relationship with the person. Um, again, also to, to be clear that this karma system is something that we're sort of constantly fine-tuning, um, and there are false positives, especially sort of in that case where an adult is contacting a minor in a legitimate way. Um, so that's really where our user operations team is kind of working to sort of sift through those flagged accounts um, and then sort of report any false positives or any trends in false positives back to our site integrity engineering team, um, which is sort of constantly, again, fine-tuning these systems. I also want to welcome uh, Perry Aptab and her, three of her teen angels who will have pride of place a little bit later, but if you guys have questions or want to raise them, you don't have to be limited to that time <laughs> in the discussion. Jim. How do you deal with the, the Jim, fact Jim, would you mind just for the people who are watching to oh, yeah. say who you are? Yes, uh, Jim Thank Carmichael, you. Chat Safe. Um, there are groups who have malicious in, 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 intentions who tend to, if you will, group together, verifying one another. How would you deal with that? Um, so, again, I 
want to specify that actually these verification questions are only asked if the recipient of the friend request or the recipient of the communication is also verified and has been on the site for some period of time and has sort of proved him or herself to be legitimate. Now, of course, you know, the system is not perfect and there could be ways to game it. Um, but that's, that's really where we fall back on our reporting infrastructure. We rely on um, you know, our 100 million users, 50 million daily active users to sort of report suspicious behavior. So if there's you know, a, a small network of users that appear to be fake who've sort of associated themselves with one high school, we are typically reported to that, uh, about that fact by one of our other legitimate users who is on that high school network. So um, the reporting system really does work for those cases to sort of um, catch any that might sort of fall through the cracks and, and kind of get around our automated systems. Who you are? Uh, Stephen Balkan with the Family Online Safety Institute. Um, I can uh, see where there could be a case to say that uh, in the case of a Chinese dissident or a whistleblower or others, the anonymity would be a very useful tool. Are, are you as a company against anonymity? Um, I would say that, that for sure anonymity can be useful on certain sites and certainly on the internet as a whole. I would say that the, the model and the approach that we've taken is, again, very much based on sort of a real name culture. And there are ways to um, certainly limit the information on Facebook that's made accessible to, that's made available to other people. Um, it might not be, you know, you might not be able to actually post in a public forum under some pseudonym. Um, but if you don't want to be found in search results, for example, if you don't want someone to be able to search for your name um, and find you that way, you can do that through our privacy settings. Um, but we really do believe that sort of this, this real name culture um, kind of creates accountability on the site. Um, and that has worked for us and also makes the tool a lot more efficient for our users. Others? Yes, please. Sorry, John Densu. Um, can you talk about how you validate the over 18 crowd? You've talked about the under 18 crowd here sure. relative to getting more access. Sure. So our authentication systems there aren't quite as robust, but um, I would say that we have, we have this sort of network-based architecture. Um, so if a user wants to join a, a, a net network for a company or workplace, for example, or wants to join a school or a college or university network, um, they actually have to sort of verify their um, relationship with that network through an, an email address issued by that school or workplace. Um, so that's one sort of mode of verification. We also have, as Chris described, kind of these CAPTCHAs that we set up. Um, so basically, if you haven't verified by one of these email addresses, or also we have mobile verification. So you can verify your account at any time by um, entering your mobile number, we send an SMS, and then you confirm that way. Um, if you haven't gone through one of these verification methods, um, then we basically will consistently show these CAPTCHAs and sort of limit or at least make, make more annoying the actions that you take on the site until you verify. Thank you. Blair. Uh, Blair Richardson from Aristotle. I wanted to start out by saying that my 18-year-old son is a huge fan and multi-hour user of uh, Facebook every, every day. Um, the, the question I had was really to sort of follow up on the, the neighborhood watch and uh, community notification types of things that you've talked about, that were talked about a little bit yesterday by companies like McGruff. Um, if you find out that somebody is a, a registered sex offender, do you then look to see who they've contacted, uh, see if they've contacted any minors? And if you do find out that they've contacted minors, do you have a policy on notifying the minor, contacting NICMEC, law enforcement? In other words, do you have a policy on how you deal with that? Yeah, so um, first off, I should have said sort of, or apologized in advance, because there may, there may be certain questions that I actually need to punt on and sort of talk to Chris Kelly since he's not able to join us this week and sort of get back to the group. Um, for this one, I can say that sort of from my own experience in user operations, um, basically when, when someone in that group um, finds out or usually we receive through, um, through email report or through one of the report links on the site, um, notice that someone on the site is a sex offender. Once we're able to verify that, we disable the account immediately. 
We also do an investigation of sort of what that person's activity on the site has been. We then pass that on to our security team, which is the team that's sort of responsible for communicating with law enforcement. So um, we feel for these, these sorts of cases, um, we should be passing that along to them so that they can then sort of contact the, um, the proper authorities and, and sort of let them know. Um, unfortunately, I don't know for sure whether we actually communicate with the users or the parents of the users that that person's been in touch with on our site. Um, but again, I can sort of check up on that. That'd be great, Simon. If sure. you don't mind, if Chris does have a response, there is an email list for the task force. And to the extent you want to make it more public in some fashion, we'll figure out how to do it. Great. Thank you. Please tell us who you are. Hi, I'm Casey. I'm one of the Teen Angels. And regarding peer verification for entry into networks, have you considered that that could be a tool for cyberbullying and that some kids could prevent others from getting into a legitimate network because they're simply being malicious? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's, that's definitely a valid concern. And I'm sure that there are cases where that's happened. Um, typically, our users are, again, pretty good at reporting that kind of behavior to us. Um, and also, these. It's, it's important to remember that these verification questions only accompany friend requests. So it would have to be sort of the person who is looking to get verified would have to send a friend request to, um, to the person who then receives that question. So um, in most cases, my guess would be that they wouldn't send those friend requests to people who would, who would be likely to reject them. But I'm sure, again, that, that this has happened before. And uh, um, when it does, we. We just rely on user reports. It's a good and helpful question. And you guys were not here yesterday, but there were a series of questions by the technical advisory board of some of the technology presenters saying, could this be turned around as a tool for bullying? So as we talk about these peer-based solutions, it'd be great to hear, hear more from you about whether that's realistic and how we should think about them. Uh, Hani Fareed. Um, Hani Fareed from Dartmouth College and a member of the TAB. I don't know if you were here yesterday to hear the presentations, but I'm wondering if you were, if there was anything you heard yesterday that you could envision incorporating into the current system that you have for identity verification, age verification, filtering, monitoring, cyberbullying, and all of those issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I thought sort of one of the technologies that was presented that, I, that is actually sort of in line, I think, a lot with our own peer verification system um, was, and I'm forgetting the name of the company now, but they have a Facebook, they actually have a Facebook application and they sort of look at, at the network structure and sort of look at the interactions that users are making and kind of um, attempt to sort of authenticate or verify users on that basis. Is this basis. a CERT ID? A CERT ID, uh -huh. yes, that's right. Um, so unfortunately, I haven't actually checked out the, the application myself on Facebook. Um, I'll need to do that. But um, it does, does seem sort of in line with this community verification principle that we've adopted. Simon, do you mind if I use moderator's prerogative and ask you a question? Sure. Um, so we heard what sounds to me like an as-is description. Is it fair just as the task force to say that everything that Chris just told us and that you're telling us, these are things that you are doing today. They're in action at the moment yes, within that's, Facebook. That's correct. Is, um, is there anything else that you can say about where you're headed to sort of directionally mm -hmm. and sort of the follow on of Hani's question? Do you foresee using more technical tools as part of it? Are you happy where you're at? Can you give just a little bit of forecasting possibly? I realize that's a somewhat unfair question, but right. it'd be really helpful to the extent you can answer it. No, I, I, I mean, I think that we've been moderately successful so far. Um, I think, as Chris stressed at a couple times in the video, we are sort of constantly working on these systems. So both existing systems where we're sort of tweaking to um, tweaking the settings to sort of make sure that they're catching all the people they need to catch and, and also not disabling people that, that shouldn't be disabled. Um, so I think we're, we're still sort of approaching this problem very much from sort of a technical, um, a technical perspective. Um, and we actually have a team of, of, as I said, site these what we call site integrity engineers who are sort of constantly working on these systems, both for user safety and also for um, sort of just spam detection and spam prevention on the site. Um, and then we have this user operations group, which is um, working very hard, and, and we're sort of continually growing out that team as our user base grows to sort of keep pace. Um, so, and there, there's sort of constantly other ideas being thrown around as to sort of ways to protect our users um, and maintain safety. Great, we'll go to Anne in one sec, but just one follow up if I might. I just want to channel Bartlett of yesterday. What is the biggest challenge that you guys face in the area that the task force is, is dealing with? Um, it would be, be great to have just a sense of where you think things are breaking. Mm -hmm. um, I would say it's, 
you know, a, a challenge that we have is kind of enforcing, enforcing that real name culture, or at least getting across to our users that that's, that's sort of how the site is meant to be used, especially internationally, I would say there's some, um, some inclination from some of our users to use the site um, on a sort of pseudonym or, or fake name basis. Um, so kind of enforcing those rules through our systems and through, um, through what Chris has just described, I think, has been, has been a challenge for us in just kind of getting across the Facebook mission and sort of what, what the site is used, that it's a, what the site is supposed to be used for, that it's a social utility um, for communicating with sort of real world connections. Thank you. We'll go Ann and then Donna Rice Hughes, and I suspect there are others. Ann Collier with Connect Safely and a member of the task force. Simon, um, yes. your users tend to be pretty outspoken about what they like and don't like in the site and the tools available. And I, I was wondering if your own users have um, expressed a desire to have you add tools or subtract tools. Um, are they happy with the privacy features you make available? And, and I wonder, you started to answer this in your previous response, but um, maybe there are diff national differences. Um, maybe overseas people have different expectations for verification. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's a, a very valid point. Um, and these are things that we're certainly assessing. We actually have a um, what we call a user insights team that is sort of um, doing um, testing with real users and with potential users and then just sort of looking at user sentiment on the site to, to kind of get a gauge or get a sense for um, and gauge what our users what our users want from the service. Um, as far as privacy controls are concerned, I'm not sure that we've done a huge amount in terms of kind of polling our users for what what they expect there. Um, generally, I think users are, for the most part, pretty satisfied with our privacy controls. Um, and it's, it's also not something that you really, you necessarily join Facebook for. Um, a lot of people, you know, join Facebook to communicate with their friends. They're, they're very happy that the controls are there and they, they use them often when they need to control access to their information. Um, but they're not, they're certainly not as passionate about privacy necessarily as they are about um, you know, a redesign of the site or something like that, so. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, I think John Morris will be after Donna Rice Hughes, um, but just to clarify on the data you showed us, were those just U.S. users, the 500 uh, young people in your polls? Uh, those were just U.S. Just users, US age 13 to 17. Donna. Hi, Donna Rice Hughes, enough is enough in the back, <laughs> member of the task force. Um, I was very impressed with the um, survey of how few of your users have come across nudity and pornography, or rarely come across it. I'm curious as to how you're keeping that type of content off your site, and how you're dealing with issues such as deep links to I'm pornography. I'm sorry, such as what? Deep links deep to links. pornography. Presumably the, links found on your site that then uh, send people into other sites, right? I see. Yes. yes. Um, so. I would say that probably our our 24-hour service level for reports of nudity, pornography, and harassing messages is, um, is is a big reason why we've been able to sort of limit that kind of content on the site. Um, you know, that's we, we've sort of prioritized those reports above others because we feel as though they're they're the most important for user safety. Um, and I think that's and I generally our users are actually very good at reporting this content. Um, they they take a certain pride in the community themselves. Um, and when they come across things that they don't like, they're quick to report them to us. Um, so I think that that's been pretty important for that. Um, as far as uh, deep links, I know you know some of these have been passed around through bots or sort of um, through spam on the site in public forums, and that's kind of a separate um, a separate group within our site integrity engineering team that's sort of working to clean those up um, along with our user operations group. Um, but we do remove sort of links to, um, you know, obviously there's an investigation that occurs, but we do remove links to pornography elsewhere on the web that sort of show up in public forums on Facebook. Um, John Morris and then uh, Jody. Simon, l l let me go back and really kind of follow up on, on some of what Ann just asked. Um, 
you know, in kind of three related questions, really looking a little bit more broadly than your Facebook service, but looking at what other alternatives are available to users. So three questions are, um, you know, are, are you aware of whether um, there are you know, young people out there who you've lost as users um, because they want a more open, less restrictive environment. Um, secondly, you know, can you give a sense of what other social networking types of sites are out there for, peop for young people who don't want the restrictions that, that you offer? Um, and, and third question um, is, um, Kind of, are any of those sites overseas? Do you know, I mean, it's a kind of broad question of where will kids go if if they don't like your service or if your service gets locked down further? It's a new task force record. Three questions all in one. <laughs> Not surprisingly, John Morris is the pace setter. Un Thank you. And unfortunately, I don't have a great answer to these questions just because I'm not sure that a study sort of as in-depth as that has been done, although I think it would certainly be valuable. Um, I'm sure that we have lost users because they sort of would like to be more open with their information. I'm sure we've lost them to other sites. I'm not really sure what those sites are. Um, but we are sort of constantly looking at our privacy model. And because our, our mission is really to you know, make the world more open, connected, more open and connected and to allow people to sort of share the information that they want to share while, while also having these privacy controls to fall back on, um, we feel as though you know, we, could, we could widen the spectrum even more you know, from, from users being able to sort of hide themselves completely and only um, show certain information to confirmed friends to people being able to sort of um, have their profile accessible to everyone. Although, you know, these are, these are discussions that we're constantly having and nothing has really been uh, decided we'll do, there. Jody, then Larry, then we'll switch over to Hima. <laughs> Um, Jody Florence with Ideology. You spoke about um, monitoring for wall posts and uh, pictures that you're presenting except, or users are putting online. How much are you doing around um, real-time communications like the chat? And are you doing that separately for the adult users versus the younger users? Mm -hmm. um, so Facebook chat is actually a pretty new feature. I think it launched uh, just a few months ago. Um, we haven't, as far as I know, we haven't done a huge amount of monitoring there um, or or maybe not any monitoring, but um, there is one thing that's important to mention there, and that is that um, chat is really only available between confirmed friends. So again, there's sort of that community verification in the form of an accepted friend request before you are able to chat with someone on Facebook. For Facebook. I totally understand how high school networks, college networks, and company networks help protect users. But I don't quite understand these community networks. So for example, I'm in Silicon Valley with probably nearly a million of my closest friends. Right. How is that protecting me or my neighbors, just simply the fact I've registered in a geographic region? Right. Um, and again, these are, these are discussions that we're having at Facebook also, just sort of trying to figure out what network model works best. Um, certainly. Uh, college workplace and, and to a lesser extent high school networks are um, probably the most sort of, or actually sorry, all of those networks are, are pretty reflective I would say of real, real life communities and real world connections. Um, the, the community networks or what we call the regional networks um, probably aren't as much and actually we, we sort of allow less access through those networks. So. For example, contact information isn't exposed to other members of a regional network. Um, so that the, the privacy controls are a little bit more restricted in that case than they are for others. Um, but again, you know, we're sort of trying to figure out the right network model going forward. So, Larry, is that responsive? These are great, great, great. Uh, please join me in thanking Simon and Chris in absentia. Right. Thanks. <laughs>